uh, today to hear from Rich Delaney. Um, lots of news coming out of the Cape Cod Climate Change Collaborative. We were just talking about that uh, earlier today. And um, Rich Delaney is the executive director of the Climate Collaborative. And I think you said, Rich, this is your first official act. Yep, first day, first act, eight o'clock in the morning, reporting <laughs> to work on duty, very early. Well, you, I think you were here at 7.30, so um, <laughs> that, that's a feather in your cap already. And you know, on behalf of the organization, we're honored to be your first uh, official act. Um, the Cape Cod Climate Change Collaborative, for those who don't know, is a 501c3. Their mission is to reduce ways or eliminate, right, in which the Cape and Islands contributes to climate change to protect our region from potentially devastating impacts. Um, Rich, you're a former senior advisor to the Center for Coastal Studies. You served the president and chief, chief executive officer there for many years, I think 14 years. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over today. I think uh, the plan and the, and the information you have speaks for itself. So thank you, Dale. Uh, thank you, Bert. Um, while the slides are coming up, I, I will say, uh, uh, as we just reminisced a minute ago, I was with you at the golf course for a presentation on climate change back in 2017, just about the time that the Cape Cod Climate Change Collaborative was uh, being founded. And uh, a lot has happened. And it's great to see us still focusing. And I'm happy to give everybody an update today. So uh, good morning to everyone. and. Um, Here's, uh, here's the, the, the presentation. Bert's been kind enough to use uh, his technical skills to advance the slides for me since I haven't mastered that yet here. Um, but I do want to uh, say that the theme or the message that I, I wanna really bring home to everybody today is that we, people, mankind, is facing the greatest techn technology and innovative challenge of history. We basically have, as a society, as people on this earth, have to reduce by 50% the amount of greenhouse gases that we are producing. And we have to do it in the next 10 years. And that only positions us well enough to complete the process of transitioning totally away from fossil fuels by 2050 in order to avoid what scientists have definitively proven to be catastrophic events, catastrophic changes to our system, to our, our world and, our, and, our, and us, uh, if we continue to do business as usual. So that's kind of the big, I mean, it's, it's almost hard to say those words sometimes because it's so scary, but that's what we're talking about, an existential challenge. And so that's the theme. Now, Dale, you mentioned a couple, yeah, just going back one, to the next one, please, Bert, go ahead. Yes, that, that's exactly who we are. Dale mentioned it, but I want to emphasize this, this is a coalition. The Cape Cod Climate Change Collaborative is a coalition of not just environmentalists, but business people, business leaders, environmental leaders, public and nonprofit organizations, faith community, educators, scientists. We need every sector, every person from every walk of life to be involved in addressing this issue. Next, please, Bert. Our mission is, as, as Dale said, simply to reduce it. How do we do that? Well, we're trying to enhance among us, Cape, we Cape Coders, uh, our communication. We have a great website. We have a fabulous newsletter. Fran Schofield, who's here, has really pioneered with Janet Williams. Both of those technologies, please take advantage of them. Uh, collaboration is among, again, as I, as I said, all sectors. Everybody's involved in it. The leadership, I think, is some of the top leaders from different sectors and on our board and our advisory council. Uh, and we're all about advocating. And advocating, this means advocating for reducing our, chain, our, our, in, our carbon footprint. And we do that through promoting uh, climate-friendly regulations, legislation, bylaws, initiatives, uh, and then, of course, activism. We need people to act. That's the key right now. Next, please, Bert. I just want to touch on this quickly. Uh, you know, we've wasted literally, well, we wasted four years during the last administration in making progress in, in addressing climate change, but we, we wasted about four decades before that 
when we knew the science pretty well, uh, but it was obfuscated by, by oil and gas industry and so forth, and we didn't really want to admit it, the science is settled. Uh, we have had um, almost unanimous agreement among scientists from every discipline looking at this issue from different perspectives. So let me just go to the next slide and I'll show you the easiest way to remember this. And that's uh, one, of the, that hot, one of the sports I love and played all my life, so it, it resonates with me. The hockey stick curve was pioneered by uh, a professor named Michael Mann at Penn State University. And in this case, you can measure uh, just about any climate related uh, parameter, whether it's the temperature of the earth, the temperature of the ocean, average temperature of the ocean, the amount of CO2 we're producing, any of those parameters have been relatively steady from about the last 1000 years. And you can see that some variation, you know, the numbers, the actual data points down below the, the hockey stick shaft vary, but overall it's a straight line until 1850s, industrial revolution, when we had the last big uh, technology disruption, uh, the disruptor, which means we, we left, stopped using wood and water as our power sources and discovered fossil fuel and started doing steam engines and fossil fuel driven uh, uh, machinery. And that's when those numbers started to go right up the, uh, the blade. And by the way, those red numbers, the red line, those are actual data points that we take with good old fashioned thermometers. I mean, this, that's not disputable. Some of the other ones in the blue, we've had to calculate through ice rings and core samples, solid science. But if you want to deny that, that's where we had some early deniers. There's no denying that. And by the way, that, that year, this just goes to year 2000, the last 22 years, that red uh, line continues to escalate very fast. Next one, please. Uh, and climate change impacts on the surface of the earth don't happen uniformly uh, because there are variations for a number of reasons, but uh, for better or for worse, we in New England, and especially Cape Cod, have a front row seat for the area of the ocean that is warming the fastest. And that's right off in the Gulf of Maine. You can see the numbers. So that has magnified and intensified all of the ocean related, of course we're surrounded by it here in the Cape, impacts uh, for us to deal with. Next one, please. Good news, however, is that the world is finally paying attention. It took 20 different meetings of world leaders over the years to finally get to an agreement, which happened in the 21st meeting in 2015 in Paris, this is well known now, but it was quite a historic event. That many pres met that many uh, leaders, top leaders, I mean, heads of state, prime ministers coming together, agreeing on every word in a 17 page document. And that was intended to not be an immediate one stop solution, but it is, is, if implemented, a way to slow the rate of climate warming. Next one, please. <clears throat> um, that, it, it, but what happened in Paris was there was some consensus. It was done on a voluntary basis. Each of the 196 countries voluntarily committed to use whatever means they had in their country to reduce CO2. And that was translated into an estimate of how that would collectively, um, cumulatively help the world reduce the warming, the, the rate of warming. And so there were a lot of details to that. How do you measure each of those various ways of reducing CO2? Who monitors it? Uh, what's fair? What's equitable? Lots and lots of, of issues. But over the last five years, since six years actually, since um, Paris, a fair amount of consensus has been made on those technical details. So when the leaders came back together in, um, Glasgow last year to measure progress, they realized they had not really made as much progress, and they knew that this was not a surprise, as they thought they had or had hoped to. So they upped the ante in many cases in Glasgow. And one of the things they finally did was to focus in on 
fossil fuels. Surprisingly, in the first 21 meetings of the world leaders, the words fossil fuels, two word fossil fuels and oil and gas had not actually been included in the consensus document at the end of each of those meetings. That's how powerful the fossil fuel sector uh, had a grip on, on everything. So finally, they, they acknowledged that's the problem. They put language in the, the, uh, the, the, the Glasgow document, which replaces or augments the Paris document, and have agreed to start to phase out the use of fossil fuels. It's, it so, sounds so simple and so much common sense. We know that has to happen, but even at that level, it was hard to get people to verbalize that so it needs to happen. Uh, and, and subsidies, by the way, if I can just spend a minute on that, that I believe has been the, maybe the biggest key, the biggest problem, because governments right now around the world provide 500 to $600 billion of government subsidies, taxpayers' money, our money, handed over to the oil and gas industry to enable them to continue doing what they're doing. This is in addition to the huge profits they are, they've been making over the years. And of course, that kind of fund from the government only allows the oil and gas industry to assert more influence, lobbying influence, uh, supporting pro oil and gas candidates in the government processes. So that stranglehold has been something that has to be broken. And finally in Glasgow, one of the breakthroughs is the acknowledgement we have to break that. Uh, another uh, interesting or, or, or breakthrough agreement was the acknowledgement that it's just not carbon dioxide and other and those greenhouse gases we've been talking about, but methane is a big contributor. In fact, it's 80% more um, impactful than, uh, than CO2. It doesn't last as long in the atmosphere, but it's, uh, it's there. So now there was a separate treaty in Glasgow that most of the nation signed on to that will commit them to eliminating or reducing the amount of methane that's produced. A, tip, a typica, difficult um, financial issue that's been a sticking point for years is the impacts of climate warming are falling primarily or largely or disproportionately, I should say, on the developing nations, the less economically developed nations, most of whom are south of the equator. Many of in, 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 in the cause of climate change, CO2 emissions is being caused by the developed nations. The United States being in the lead for years, now China, United States, EU and so forth, all are the, the, the emitters. So in terms of equity, there has been agreement that the developed nations would contribute a hundred billion dollars a year to the developing nations to help them offset the impacts and to develop their own uh, climate initiatives. So um, that has been a difficult argument, but uh, one that's finally had uh, agreement and some of that money starting to flow. The, the other key point that came out of Glasgow is after the scientists did a lot of calculations of the, the voluntary commitments, they believe and have stated, we, the nation, the world, can still actually reach the target that was set in Paris, which is to not allow the average temperature of the earth to increase more than 1.5 degrees Celsius over since the industrial revolution. That's still the target. The path is narrowed, but we have to, we can still take it. And a big, big way to do that is to divert private sector investment away from oil and gas to renewables and the private sector stepped up and the investment sector stepped up big time in Glasgow to the tune of about a trillion dollars. So that's all good. And the last thing there, message from Glasgow is the same leaders are gonna come back in just one year, next year in Egypt to continue this discussion. So that's the good news. Uh, sorry to spend so much time on this slide, but this is an important one. Uh, Bert, can we go to the next one, please? Rich, just one thing real quick. You're, uh... If you said this, I apologize, I missed it. Uh, it's important to note, you're actually attending these conferences. You're, yep. you're, 
you're seeing you're seeing this you're kind of seeing this develop and unfold firsthand uh, thanks Bill. yes i've attended all of these if since before paris i've been attending every international climate change meeting on behalf of a, an organization that has been trying to put oceans on the international agenda it's a little different uh, well it's important that's why i was there and on behalf of the uh uh, Center for Coastal Studies, uh, oceans had been left out of the discussion in these international things for years, uh, inexplicably, because um, the impact of climate change on oceans is uh, is huge, and the two are, are inextricably related. So um, I've been attending, uh, we put pulled together ocean action days at each of these, including Glasgow, and finally the message got through, and there is in the Glasgow agreement, I think 71 action items and about seven of them, seven of them relate to oceans. So thanks, Dale. Yeah, this is this is why uh, I've had a, a platform, um, small platform, but I've been part of this whole thing. But here's uh, here's the uh, just I'll just touch on this quickly. The International Panel on uh, Climate Change is really um, the key science body. People, uh, th literally thousands of scientists contribute to heavily or, or, or critically reviewed, peer reviewed documentation. And that's the assessment. And the last one that came out is in the process. Next slide, please, Bert. This is the, uh, the sixth report from the IPCC and uh, it's coming out in three parts. Physical scientists for science assessment in August. The impacts that that will have in the world came out just a month ago. And next month or this month now, uh, we will have the third part, which we'll talk about mitigation. And uh, this is uh, this is this is the, the Bible. And and I keep saying I should probably say, stop here and say, you know, 1.5 degrees Celsius. The rest of the world uses that and they understand that. But since we're kind of a Fahrenheit group here in the United States, that means that's 2.7 degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah. Right. That you, know, what you might say one degree, big deal, but 2.7 degrees average temperature of the earth is, is, is incredible. And that's what we have to allow to have no more than that. If we go do business as usual, we get to two degrees centigrade, which is 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit. And in the worst case scenario, the average temperature of the earth is projected to go up as much as four degrees centigrade or about seven and a half degrees Fahrenheit. I mean, that I think resonates more with us when we use Fahrenheit and that's how serious this is. So the next one, please, Bert. Uh, and, you know, I don't have to tell you too much more about this slide. You know what's happening on the Cape. I just talked about the increasing temperatures, severe storm, storms are happening, increased frequency or when they do happen, the severity is, uh, is, is there. A warmer temperature allows more moisture to be in the atmosphere. That intensifies hurricanes. When we do have rain, it's more moisture in the atmosphere. We have deluges. Uh, one aspect that uh, we had better pay attention to here in the Cape is the increasing ocean acidity. Uh, as we put carbon dioxide into the air, that's CO2, and uh, excessive amounts go into the atmosphere, some of that, fortunately, over time has been assimilated by the ocean, which has helped sort of us help reduce the impact of our excess production, but it has increased the acidity of the oceans. CO2 plus one uh, molecule of oxygen is CO3. That's carbonic acid. That's why the ocean is acidifying. Uh, one of the issues that hasn't been well known, but boy, when that happens, all kinds of biological chemical changes will happen in our oceans. Sea levels rising. Um, we know that it's been about a foot in the last century, it's been another foot in the first 50 years of this, I mean, 100 years ago, the last 50 years, basically it's doubling every, every year, uh, every 50 years. And the projections are, if we get to that, Two, two degrees, uh, 2.6 degrees Fahrenheit or more, we'll see three, four, five, six feet of 
ocean rising, ocean uh, sea level rise. This morning's paper reports that uh, a massive section of uh, the ice flow in Antarctica has broken off. There's enough water frozen in that South Pole that if it all were to melt, and this is the beginnings of it, we could see 16 feet of sea level rise globally. Variations, little place, but that's it. That would do, that would, you, I won't even tell you what, you can imagine what's going on. Uh, shifting habitats, another one that doesn't, that people don't understand, but we do in the Cape Cod because the water has warmed off of the Cape and in George's Bank, so much so that the codfish do not find it uh, possible to survive there, nor do the lobsters. So they are shifting their habitats, migrating north. What does that do for our fishing industry? Well, it disrupts it, obviously. So anyway, you know these things are serious and uh, there are plenty of them. And that's just mostly on the ocean side. You know, we have uh, heat waves happening on the land. One of the major, in fact, the number one killer of people from the disasters is not floods, not forest fires, not hurricanes. It's heat, heat exhaustion extreme heat. So um, that's going to continue to increase. So let me go on to the next step. Let me get to the good news. Uh, technology is, is, uh, is going to have to step up and help. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the obvious ones because as Bert mentioned, the other speakers in this series of uh, Earth Tech Month will talk about a major opportunity we have with offshore wind. Fortunately, it's starting to move here right off New England. That's going to be a major piece of the solution. Solarization is another major piece, and you're going to hear about that in, from successive uh, speakers. Uh, simple nuts and bolts things like weatherizing our existing houses. That's a key piece. It's not technology per se, per se but in a way, some of the more advanced uh, methods and materials for, for better insulation is, is happening. And uh, I'm gonna throw into the mix, good old conservation. You know, if we can reduce the amount of energy we need by reducing some of our consumption patterns, our behavioral patterns, that's gonna help as well. But I'm gonna go on to talk about some of the other in interesting innovations that together will make, I think, hopefully a technology movement. Could I get to the next one, Bert, please? Uh, in this happening, climate technology field is growing quickly. Uh, it's estimated about 3,000 new climate tech startups have happened just in recent years. Uh, one by one measure, $87 billion has been invested in this, in this, in this area with a 200% growth rate in the, in the investment. So uh, that's the good news. And what are some of these things looking at? It's actually pretty fascinating. Next, the The um, one industry that has been a major culprit in producing CO2 as a byproduct from their, their work is uh, cement. Uh, and just look around us, we've covered the earth with cement. Uh, so much so, by the way, the cement needs sand um, or to get it to concrete. Um, there's a, a sand, a global sand shortage as we are taking so much cement, adding sand to make concrete. Uh, so how do we change this? Well, uh, I won't go too much into the details, but it takes about uh, limestone. Limestone is heated uh, up to about 2,700 degrees, which is, is what is needed to convert, uh, to make cement, that releases an enormous amount of CO2. So if uh, in this new technology, it can be fired at a lower temperature, we can cut those emissions by about a third. And um, we could also do a little bit of an innovation by when concrete is being cured using CO2 gas, we can lock some of that CO2 into the production of it itself. So the, the potential for reducing CO2 by 1.5 gigatons is huge. Uh, and by the way, it saves a trillion liters of water. Uh, so green cement is gonna be one of our keys. Uh, next, please. Agriculture across the board, not just, not just uh, uh, you know, cows here, but agriculture generally is a major source of CO2. And um, methane is something that these uh, grazing animals produce from their belching. Uh, it sounds kind of silly, yes, it does, but 
the UK has developed a, a halter that rests loosely over a, a cow's nostrils, monitors the methane exhaust, and then can zap it with a catalyst, creating water and less harmful CO2 and lowering the bovine emission by half. Um, uh, Far-fetched? No, no, but that's what innovative technologies do. They take a new, they take a new concept and, and, and apply it differently and, and it can help a lot. Of course, another way to reduce uh, methane from the egg sector is all of us stop eating meat, become vegans at least one day a week, or two days, two days a week. Um, that would cut the global demand for uh, meat production and certainly help a lot. Uh, next one, please. All right, shipping, in global shipping, and, and, and that's a huge industry that's increasing all the time. Globalization has made us ship about 80% of all the goods we consume across the ocean, a ocean, it's an ocean at some time. Uh, but those ships produce an incredible amount of CO2, usually burning a low quality bunker fuel that uh, fouls the air, of course, and, and produces toxic particles. If we can find a way to convert that fuel to hydrogen cells, uh, which is possible. And in fact, uh, we have a, a prototype happening in some of the Scandinavian nations are building large uh, ferries powered by hydrogen fuel cells, uh, which create the energy from hydrogen gas and release water only as a byproduct. Uh, that uh, in itself will be green and it will be terrific. So this promise there that we can retrofit our shipping industry uh, to be uh, truly um, sustainable. Uh, next, please. Um, now, the way we design and build our cities, uh, we've created these uh, massive areas of concrete and asphalt and rooftops. But the other side of that coin is it presents an opportunity to, um, to offset these, what we call urban heat islands, which sometimes raise the temperature of that area in the city by uh, as much as three degrees. Uh, and this is where we've had, when we do have the heat waves with more 90 degree days in the future, uh, that's has been, as I said earlier, deadly to residents. Uh, and it also, ironically, increases the demand for air conditioning, which creates further exacerbation of our CO2. So where possible, cities are beginning to figure out ways to green themselves, adding trees, not only for, for, for the aesthetic value, but to provide shade and to reduce the temperature. Trees also provide that ecosystem service of absorbing CO2. So um, uh, it's great. And, and by the way, there are over 2,000 mayors attending the Paris climate meeting, and the, many of them have come to subsequent meetings. And they go back and really uh, have worked, uh, I think, great, uh, made great strides in our urban areas. And the good news there is more than half of the world's population now, for the first time in history, lives in an urban settlement. So there's a chance for you know, a big return on the dollar when you get that many people living in a sustainable urban area. Uh, next, please. Uh, you know, citing solar uh, uh, facilities, solar uh, farms and PVs are, have always been um, a bit of a challenge. Uh, here in Cape Cod, we found ourselves and the collaborative found itself looking at supporting um, the increased number of solar installations. But then we realized some of those installations were being proposed in virgin wooded areas where the elimination of that, those acres of trees would be, off, would be needed to put the solar panels in. So we saw right away the conflict. So we've developed some policies to try to, to, try to harmonize and in, in, in basically shift the priority sites to a huge number of acres of uh, rooftops, parking lots in commercial and residential and uh, manufacturing buildings to be the primary site for it. But even then we are hard pressed to find sufficient area. So when you look at it globally, there are massive dams all over the world with these um, uh, 
um, areas that are the water behind the dam. So floating solar is an issue that maybe not so much germane to the Cape, but is being pursued by the World Bank and others uh, in many places around the world. Uh, it um, allows for a, a flat, calm area to be um, exploited as uh, uh, for, for the solar farms. And um, I guess the World Bank has projected terawatts of capacity coming out of this. Uh, next one, please. Um, so electric planes. Now that is germane to the Cape Cod because uh, our, our colleague Dan Wolf or Cape Air is uh, one of the pioneers in bringing this into uh, existence. Uh, globally, uh, electric planes, I mean, plane uh, air travel accounts for about 2% of our carbon emissions. Um, we think that, and Dan does think that planes that fly in about 500 miles or less round trip is a sweet spot for using electric planes because they can go right back to where they started from and be recharged a little bit later. That, uh, that accounts for an awful lot of our, of our airline uh, industry. Uh, so you will see some progress being made here, maybe as soon as 2024. Um, by the way, if you think about how many planes are in the air, uh, as, at any one time, there's probably an estimates 10,000 aircraft flying around the world. Um, that's pre-pandemic. It went down a little bit during the pandemic. It's coming back up. But if you get 10,000 planes in the air with 100 people, average per plane, you got a million people up there every, every minute, every day, 365 in polluting machines. So this has, a, this has some potential to, to make a, a major change. All right, uh, let me just get through the last two. Next one, please, Jim. Um, Bert, one more. Yeah, so tidal energy. Here's an, here's, a, here's an example of using the natural systems, the tides, the waves, uh, as an untapped source of energy. Uh, we have um, uh, seen uh, opportunities in the Bay of Fundy on tidal power, but also just putting submergible turbines to collect the tidal flow, whether it be Cape Cod Canal, which is ideal. I know Mass Maritime Academy and others have done some experimentation with uh, capturing that flow that goes on one tide one way at a very steady current, and then the tide shifts, change the props, and you can have uh, a 24-hour um, uh, source of clean energy. So tidal energy, not as anywhere near as big as potential scale as solar and, uh, and wind, but it has to add to the mix. Next, please. And these are interesting. We're, I, I, so far, uh, we've had a couple, well, actually there's been one example that we know of, Michigan State University has announced they're making over their entire biomedical and physical science building with fully transparent solar windows. These are PV, you know, photo photo photovoltaic energy um, receptors integrated into the window coating. So basically the window is producing energy while letting light through. Uh, if this technology can advance and be implemented far and wide, this would be absolutely terrific. Um, it would also um, um, enable uh, retrofitting of old buildings, but also clearly be installed in, in new buildings. So uh, like solar glass, there is also some major progress being made in solar shingles or PV shingles, where you can put on your roof instead of that asphalt dark colored stuff we have up there, you could put something that looks similar, but actually is uh, a PV uh, mechanism. So that's, uh, that's very promising and uh, a, a very cool technology, I think. One more, please. Bert. Um, air conditioning. Look, look at that photo. Uh, this may be, well, the air conditioning is, is a huge factor. And ironically, as we continue to warm the planet, more people are going to be demanding this to stay cool, which only exacerbates the heating. Uh, right now, uh, as the Chinese economy, just as one example, has boomed over the last 
uh, 20 years, that middle class has emerged and they are now numbering hundreds of millions of people all living a higher life standard, all wanting air conditioners. So there's a, there's a big demand, but it cannot go on as in the past with inefficient uh, energy uh, pro uh, consuming CO2 producing uh, uh, air conditions. So <clears throat> technology here is kind of fun to think about too. Uh, air condition is cool and dehumidify at the same time. Uh, and the more humid the air, the more energy air conditioning uses. So some of the little innovations here involve the energy required to cool the air goes in via a sponge-like material that grabs moisture from the atmosphere, enabling the unit to cool the air more efficiently. And you're using the, the, uh, the heat used by the air conditioner can then dry the material for the next cycle. So uh, I, I'm not an air conditioning expert, obviously, but there's some good news there about technology innovation that can really help in a big scale when you think about the number of air conditioners that are, exist throughout the, uh, the earth. I think the number now is about 4.5 billion. So uh, big opportunity for technology advancement. Uh, Bert, one more, please. I'm trying to get through pretty quickly so we can leave some time for, for Q and A, but here's an interesting one too. Uh, you already, I think you know, because we're a fishing community down here, unfortunately more, maybe, maybe fortunately, more than half of all the world's seafood, in fact, it's actually a lot more than half, is produced by aquaculture. Uh, mm -hmm. And a big part of the aquaculture is seaweed, growing part, 27%. So here's an opportunity. Kelp is a low carbon way to produce nutritious food and all kinds of other materials. Uh, it avoids having to increase our agriculture on land which of course is energy intensive and adds fertilizers and so forth and so on. And uh, it can produce um, a, a number of things that eventually could be used uh, as biofuel. Uh, I know that uh, I had a chance to meet with uh, the then secretary of the Navy, Ray Mabus, uh, about uh, nine, eight, nine years ago. And he said the US Department of Defense and particularly his Navy was incorporating biofuel in their ships and their jet planes. Uh, so, you know, there's, this is not far-fetched. Seaweed, biofuel, um, we have some people in the Cape who are pursuing seaweed farming. And I think that's a, a growing technology that we should uh, keep an eye on. So one more, let me wrap this up so we can get to Q&A. Uh, <clears throat> I've gone through a bunch of technologies. Uh, you're gonna hear more in our, in, from the future speakers, but that's just one part of the solution. We need fundamental changes across how people live, how we, how we produce our, our food, how we consume, how we drive, how we heat our houses. Uh, it's gonna take every sector and every individual to make those fundamental changes. Uh, that's why I said at the outset of this discussion, this is a huge, biggest challenge, an existential challenge that the uh, people that the earth has ever faced. The good news is that IPCC panel says that says that we can still do it. That 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 target of keeping the average temperature of the Earth less from warming less from warming not more than two degrees Celsius is achievable. But the time window is closing. We need strong political and business sector leadership. Uh, people say to me, what can I do? Well, there are a whole bunch of things you can do, but the best thing you can do is make sure our elected officials are totally committed to dealing with and addressing climate change. And then uh, I think we'll get, uh, we'll see what happens in Egypt when those world leaders come back together this coming November, it's right around the corner. We'll see and take measurements about the state of it then. The IPCC report said it's still um, possible, but the windows closing. So hopefully uh, the Technology Council can do our little part. I know Cape Cod Climate Change Collaborative is there to help encourage, to share information, to stimulate action, to bring all of us together. Uh, we're going to do our part and we invite you all to be uh, in the next slide. You can see the, I think our website, uh, you can uh, join as volunteers. 
join as a sponsor, subscribe to our newsletter so you can stay current on everything I just told you, plus a whole lot more. Visit our website. We're designing the website in a way that others can use it. We're hoping that local uh, climate action network, our local committees in each town can take off and take control of what they're doing with the municipal government so that uh, it can be more green and sustainable. Uh, we'll have a, a website that can be utilized by each town to help share its information and to learn. And of course, we um, we need a little bit of money. We've got great, great volunteers. A lot of them that I've already mentioned who are on the, on the, on the call today, but uh, we really want to up ramp up what we're doing as a, as a group and include more people, more activity, more action, more uh, ab um, advocacy on, on, on this issue. So some of that will take a few dollars. So we're, we're happy to receive your, your donations as a 501c3. So thank you for your attention. I moved through a lot of information, but I hope there are a few, a few questions and we can get to the discussion. That was great, Rich, thank you. Um, I think that was just the right amount of information. Um, I think we all know the challenges and the dangers, but there are actually a, a couple of new things that I learned today. And one of them is, you know, we all play a part in this. We can all do something, even if it's, we may not be on the scale of a global economy. We all have something we can do. And we do have a couple questions. If you, if folks, if you have other questions, put them in now. I just want to ask you if you could also just mention the net zero Cape Cod conference. Uh, I put the link in the chat. That's a great, it's more than just a conference. It's, it's a whole initiative that's really, you can be uh, using the information year round. But if you go to the link, you click the sponsors button, you'll see the, the, the businesses and the people that are supporting the, the initiative. And if you go to the watch button from last year's conference, you'll be able to see everything from how businesses can get involved, individuals can get involved, advocacy, um, being a catalyst for change, but also like green jobs and getting involved a little bit more. I don't know if you wanna touch on that really quickly before we jump into the questions. Thank you very much, Dale. That's, I mean, I didn't wanna go on, on to, uh, but that's exactly right. One of the major uh, offerings that the Cape Cod Climate Change Collaborative has been four net, what we call net zero conferences. We will have another one coming up this fall. Um, and it's just, as you said, it's an opportunity to bring the Cape Cod and Islands community together, share information, put a spotlight on, on it. Our last net zero conference theme was to, to be able to illustrate how there is action going on at the federal government. And there are major initiatives in this new administration and that, that are being reinforced at the state level by our legislators here in the Cape who have been leaders to put together a climate action plan. That is being reinforced at the regional level by the Cape Cod Commission. And uh, they have developed a climate action plan. And then uh, what we did last year was to try to illustrate that in our conference and say, by the way, the snowball effect can come all the way down. We can use all of that roadmap coming from national to state to regional to encourage action right in the local community, these local action networks, and that's happening. So uh, we'll have another another conference to get to in the fall. There'll be more information coming on that soon, but Dale, thank you for reminding me about that. That's, um, that's a big piece of what we do. Great, so uh, just one comment from Fran, uh, who's also, Fran, you're, you're, you're a dynamo and as well as Janet and everyone else in the in the collaborative. Um, she just mentioned here, in addition to bringing Rich aboard as the executive director, we're pleased to announce that Dorothy Savarees is the new president of our board of directors. Thrilled to have them both. So congratulations to both of you. I love seeing Dorothy's name come up on these meetings when she comes because she always has, always has awesome insightful things to say. Um, so congratulations to you both. And now let's get into the first question. Carl had a sort of a comment and a question. Um, this might be a little bit over my head, but I'm sure Rich will know. Um, Carl says, the largest carbon storage in the world is done through ecosystems to marine sediment. Coastal ecosystems like eelgrass and salt marshes are, um, are among others that perform this work in addition to numerous other benefits. In your opinion, 
Um, should coastal ecosystem restoration be emphasized? Thanks, Carl. Absolutely. Uh, globally, that is a huge, huge opportunity for us to provide what we call eco the ecosystem services that the global, in this case, the marine environment provides. Uh, mangrove swamps, salt marshes, uh, eelgrass, all of those plants absorb CO2. It's a natural sequestration. Uh, often we think about, oh, we have to save the Amazon uh, forests and jungles and forests everywhere. And that's absolutely true. And we have to save those because likewise, plants absorb CO2. But it's also happening in the marine side. It's a great opportunity. A lot of the people talk that I work with internationally talk about blue carbon. That mean that is the that 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 area of the ocean uh, can absorb lots of carbon dioxide. So uh, why how does that work in terms of policy management <clears throat> uh, in other parts of the world? Like mangrove uh, swamps are being stripped out to replace them with growing shrimp. Bad trade off. Uh, we in the United States have already filled in almost half of all our salt marshes over time or history, bad trade-off. So we have to, as you suggested in your question, Carl, preserve those natural ways of, of, of sequestering CO2. Great question. Thank you for the response. Uh, looks like next question here is from Ed. Ed uh, on our programming committee here says, thanks for a great presentation. Um, Ed built a house in East Dennis in 2017 pursued geothermal heat and solar panels. Front of the house faces directly south. Um, Ed was informed, Ed was informed approval unlikely due to it being a, a historic district. Um, kind of gave up on geothermal, couldn't get a contractor, et cetera, et cetera. Are you aware of any improvements in these areas? Geothermal seems more viable. Yeah, uh, this has just put his finger on the top of the iceberg. You know, it's easy for me to say we have to change this, we have to change that. When we get down into the weeds and we look at the regulations, the bureaucracies, the, the biases that have already been built into our system, change is not easy. Uh, and he just cited a great one. Yes, we, we, we value historic districts, that's important. But it can't be at the exclusion of dealing with climate change. So we have to find a way to bring those two public goods into a compatible use. Uh, as simple as, you know, historic district commission should allow solar on the non street side of a house, perhaps if it face if it's properly suited, or but we have to deal with these. And 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 the same thing with um, the way the zoning we have we have um, building codes that are set statewide and are implemented locally about how much insulation is required. But we feel, a lot of people say, to really weatherize all of the existing houses, we're going to have to meet that code and some, or at least are in new construction, go to what we call the stretch code. That's going to take people, us, in our town meetings, voting to approve changes to our zoning, or in this case, the building code, that's going to take some doing because why? It costs a little bit more money and people usually balk at that point. So the, the, the mindset that has to change among us people is, you know, we have to do our part. And if it means a few more bucks at the gas pump right now because of what's happening in Ukraine, or a few more bucks in your insulation when you put the addition on your house, Think of it as your ability to invest in mitigating climate change for the long run. Great response. Uh, Rich, if, if Ed you know, was really passionate about kind of bringing this technology to his historic home, um, you talk a lot about ad advocacy and reaching, the, reaching folks uh, who make these decisions, who create the policy. Where would Ed start? Where would someone like Ed start if they wanted to like start to make a, an impact in how our current town regulations are, are working? Is it like a local level? Is it a state level? 
Well, he, Ed, Ed can work at all the levels, certainly local level for stretch code approval and so forth. Um, I'd refer him, and I know Maggie Downey, the uh, executive director of the Cape Light Compact, spoke to you, I think, at your last meeting. Mm -hmm. uh, she is a wonderful resource. The Cape Light Compact has great resources. Uh, they would be, and she's trying to help pioneer the use of heat pumps here in the Cape. Uh, I think. I think I mentioned deep pump. Um, so I would refer it to Maggie and the Cape Light Compact as well. Um, so yeah, it's it's a multi-level, uh, multi-faceted uh, uh, response is necessary. Um, again, illustrating the complexities that we have to overcome. Great, sorry to put you on the spot like that. I appreciate the answer. Um, no move next to Dr. Jane Ward. Jane, you always have great questions also. Uh, thanks, Rich, uh, for a great presentation, and Ed for mentioning geothermal. Um, she, all, she and Steve uh, also were interested in geothermal. Um, for home, having had the best HVAC system when they lived in Texas previously using geothermal. Um, do you know of any geothermal resources on Cape Cod? I don't know if that's a contractor question or a place to get more information on the validity of it. Uh, but any thoughts on geothermal resources on Cape Cod? Yeah. Um, well, again, again, Cape Light Compact is a, is a great spot for starting that discussion. Uh, Maggie, I know, has told us and told you guys at your last meeting, uh, there are some basic logistical problems like contractors who are not really familiar, or a lack of contractors who are not able to, are uh, not familiar enough with this new technology kind of new. So that has to be solved. Uh, and so we have to train young technicians to, to be able to handle that. Uh, but the, the potential for heat pumps uh, combined with solar panels to produce the energy to run the heat pump on house by house or building by building is really, really um, significant. And that's the route that I think Maggie's trying to get us to go. Now, how does she do that? Well, there are things called the Department of Public Utilities and the Department of, of Energy Resources, state level uh, regulatory bodies that are maybe not as progressive enough. So as a, as a group, we Cape Codders with a delegation, our legislative delegation, have to open those doors at the state level to allow those new technologies to be implemented and move to, as it comes down, down, the, down to us at the local level. So, um, uh, I, I think, I know Dorothy and Fran and Janet, my colleagues are on the line. They may have a, an additional thought about heat pumps. Um, we've talked about them a little bit recently at the, the collaborative meetings, but uh, if not, I'll go on to the next question. Uh, so I think that's the, that's the last question. Um... I just had a comment, you know, thank you, Rich. Agree 100% on the issues and the details for folks. They want to act locally. He uh, mentioned that Senator Sear filed a, a recent bill and act relative to installing solar energy systems in historic homes. That's an interesting topic. Um, and I think uh, that's it. That's it for our questions. If you check in the chat, there's a link to uh, how you can reach Rich at the collaborative, the net zero event, and of course on our website and the newsletter, there'll be other ways to learn more. And I say thank you, Rich. That was that was really great. Appreciate the questions, everyone. I hope you learned something. I know I did. Thank you.